Pros, just Tech Pros here. I uh, wanted to go over a few things today. Uh, it's been a little bit since my last podcast as I try to, I don't like to just come on here and talk about, you know, things that aren't really interesting or things that I'm not, uh, that, that kind of came into my mind that I felt uh, needed to be discussed. So uh, a couple things hit me. Uh, one tonight, actually, I watched the show that I want to talk about. But a few things I wanted to discuss. First, uh, update on the Wikipedia thing. As I said on my last episode, unfortunately, it looks like my prediction was accurate where I didn't think I would get anywhere. And uh, it's not for uh, lack of trying. And I'm going to continue to try just to uh, keep it going. But I've actually had my staff email a bunch of reps. Uh, I think I told you last time I got a, a ton of emails that I was asking to clarify why I wasn't allowed to update certain facts uh, regarding a page on Wikipedia where it pertained, in, uh, pertained to a uh, person that was on there. And uh, I'm actually just trying to change things to reflect the record and to reflect factual court documents. And anyway, I went back and forth. I got a lot of running around. I got a lot of email this person, email that person. And I've been doing that, and I'm not getting any clear concise answers you know it's a lot of ambiguity and um, uh, a lot of just usually when things are made complicated in life it's because the individual you're dealing with just doesn't want to rectify the problem they just want to try to confuse the person and you know uh, not really come up with a solution so I think that's what I'm up against but again I've had my staff email them I told them to email them all every day until we get some kind of uh, resolution because I needed to explain to me how you're unable to up update a page with factual information and yet a page is flooded with uh, newspaper articles and blogs and that they're using that as the data to populate a page when in fact I don't know how anybody in their right mind could believe that that is more credible than court documents and court records. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, as of now, I'm still banned from Wikipedia, which I find amusing. And now, this was actually kind of funny. What they did was, as opposed to banned, because I guess they figured out, you know, anybody, I could just use another IP address, or you could just, you know, log in from somewhere else, and you could make the edits. They must have figured out that that could be done, because now they actually shut the page down, and what I mean by that is they stopped any edits from any IPs or anything. They, you're not even allowed to edit the page at all. So I find that really amusing. You know, it goes to show who's running these, these things. I mean, just think about that common sense wise. If there's a, a public page and, you know, Wikipedia is supposed to allow individuals to go on and update with facts. Now to shut down that page so nobody can make an update, what does that tell you? That tells you whoever's running it or the powers to be that are running it, they want to keep the narrative on there and they don't want to change it. And they don't want anybody changing it. I found that very, very interesting to shut down a page of all edits. If you go to it, it just says, you know, you cannot update this page. Uh, it had some kind of terminology uh, where they were trying to say it was being flooded with spam or something like that. I don't remember reading it because I was, I was more in shock that a page was shut down from any edits. No edits are allowed at this point. So it's really something else that they went out of their way on this one particular page on Wikipedia. I guess this person that I'm trying to change is that important to them, and they want to make sure that the public sees all the lies that they have on the page. And as we know, that's what they do based on whoever target is. Uh, they're going to want to keep those lies going. And if you try to refute them and you try to sh give some clarity and, and some accuracy, this is what happens. So I hope the public realizes, you know, Wikipedia is not really a great source that you may think it will be. You know, some know that. I mean, I've always known it wasn't, you know, really a great source of information. Um, on a side note, I'm a big, uh, on a hobby, I'm really into dogs. I read about dogs. I've been studying dogs for 30 years. I know all about breeds. Just something I do on the side. Always took an interest. And uh, the information on dog breeds on Wikipedia is way off, and on dog history, and uh, it's just way off. So I never really, using that as a gauge, I always knew it was never really uh, accurate. But I had no idea that it was run on this level 
when it pertains to individual pages, you know, when somebody who may be high profile, and if you try to update it, how it's regulated, I never realized that. And as I talked about, you know, I started Googling it a little bit and searching about it, and I'm not the only one who, who faced this problem. There was other high-profile individuals uh, who, who faced similar problems when they tried updating their page. And also, um, for those, I guess, that they're promoting or those that they want to help, whoever runs Rick Wikipedia, they actually do the opposite effect. Uh, they remove any defamatory comments or any um, negative press or negative information. Uh, I was just reading a big article about that. And I tell you, it just goes to show you how these things are run. And the public needs to be a little bit more aware and wake up a little bit and understand what's being done right in front of their eyes and not be a flock of sheep and just go in line with everything that happens. You know, you got to be free thinkers and you got to question. You know, without questioning things, you just kind of fall in line, and I think that's what a lot of people are scared of, uh, especially, you know, those in power. They don't like free thinkers, and they don't like those who try to think outside the box. They want everybody to believe whatever they're selling and to buy whatever they're selling and to believe whatever narrative they're putting out there. So this was a bit of a lesson on the level of Wikipedia, you know, on that level, because, again, I never looked into it. I was never that vested. I was never that interested and uh, I was I was surprised in that sense. Although I shouldn't be at this point in my life, nothing should surprise me when it relates to things like that. But that surprised me a little bit. I got to be honest. So anyway, another thing I learned that was quite disturbing that I didn't know. And again, um, I've been in business since I'm 19 years old, and uh, I'm 43 now. So I've seen a lot. I've done a lot. But I've just uh, last few years I got involved in the legal aspect of things when I opened up my litigation company. And what I learned, I was having an in-depth conversation with an attorney. You know, when you, and, and I'm sure a lot of people aren't going to be aware of this because I, I find it, I find it very uh, odd and it's just, it doesn't really make sense to me. I can't wrap my head around it. Um, when you go for sentencing, a judge, in order to sentence you, a judge is allowed to weigh even counts or crimes that the jury acquitted you of, the judge could actually take that into account and weigh that into your sentencing. So let's say you were acquitted of, uh, you were found guilty of, of two crimes. One was for bank robbery, let's just say, and one was for assault. You were acquitted of the bank robbery but found guilty of assault, and now you could go for, you go for sentencing. The judge could actually factor in if you would have been found guilty of the bank robbery into the sentencing. And I needed a, a lawyer to explain that to me because, again, logically that made zero sense to me. How could a judge just dismiss a, 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 an innocent verdict, a not guilty verdict, I should say, from the, from the jury? That's basically saying, you know, the judge could just knock that out and give you a higher sentence based on everything you were charged with. And the attorney told me, yeah, that, that's what can happen because a judge in sentencing works differently. They go by a preponderance of evidence as opposed to guilty or innocent beyond a reasonable, guilty, I should say, beyond a reasonable doubt. So there's a lower threshold. So a judge could disregard, you know, in simple terms, a judge could disregard a jury's verdict of not guilty because they have to have a higher threshold. So the jury had to believe somebody was not guilty. Uh, they were not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So they then found the person not guilty. A judge, on the other hand, during sentencing, could just go by preponderance of evidence. So the prosecution could submit in their sentencing recommendations, they could say, you know, Your Honor, even though at trial this person was found not guilty of this charge, uh, we would like you to consider it due to the preponderance of evidence in your sentencing uh, decision. So when the prosecution puts in a uh, sentencing submission, they could actually refer to that count that you were acquitted of and, and disregard the verdict and just ask the judge to rely on it when he or she uh, contemplates your sentencing. 
So if that charge that you were acquitted of holds a high sentence, the judge could still use that and hit you with that. And again, you know, when I, when I got involved in this, I remember telling somebody, I said, you have to throw all logic out the window because things that would make sense to me on a business sense, on a logical sense, on a common sense, you got to throw it out the window because when you hear these things play out, any rational person would realize that that's a huge disconnect. That's a huge problem, and it, and it just doesn't, it doesn't uh, make any kind of sense whatsoever, you know. So I, I just had to share that because I found that so confusing, and it was a learning experience and something I didn't know uh, because on my end, again, what my firm does is we focus more on the um, discovery side and the evidence side and helping the attorneys bu build the case and the investigative side and, and prepare for trial. But now this is the first time uh, that we're dealing with uh, an appeal and, and following up with the case after the fact. You know, So going through the motions and now sentencing's coming up, and when I saw the prosecutor's sentencing submission, and I saw that they were referring to crimes that the defendant was acquitted of, and they're asking the judge to factor it in anyway into her sentencing, it blew my mind. You know, I, I was like, what are they doing? This person was acquitted of this charge. How could they now ask her or, you know, to, uh, to factor that in? And long story short, they can. And I, I was, you know, again, I was trying to apply common sense to something that it doesn't apply. You got to throw that out the window because this is just how it works, you know. And uh, even the lawyer was telling me when he became a lawyer years ago, He's an older gentleman, and he said he, he, he couldn't believe it either. You know, he found it he found it just as shocking as I did. So we had a long conversation about that, and uh, I'm sure I used a lot of uh, explicitives when I uh, spoke to him, and <laughs> I wasn't too happy about that. And, you know, it's just something, just another way that they kind of angle around to get what they want, you know, another tool they could use. It's disturbing when you think about it. All the, all these tools they could use to circumvent what's just. It really is. So tonight I was watching this show, and you got to start watching it. It's called Outcry, and it's on Showtime. I think it's on every Sundays because I, I think tonight was the premiere. I caught the later episode, but I tell you this this was this is some story. It's, I think it's five parts. Tonight was five, uh, part one. It's about this kid. He was a football star in Texas. His name was Greg Kelly. Now, this kid had everything going for him. He had full scholarships to every college. He was a phenomenal football player in Texas. And he had uh, offers from three different colleges, big universities, full rides. Unfortunately, this kid winds up getting accused of being a pedophile, which, as you know, how I feel or any human being should feel about it. it's the lowest of the low but I think something that's horrible and wretched is to be accused of something so god-awful when you're innocent I can't think of anything else to be accused of uh, that's worse if you didn't do it I mean there's nothing nothing worse to be accused of and this this poor kid was 18 when he was accused of this now everything was stripped away from this kid they obviously he lost all the scholarships so I'm watching, you know, in episode one, they show how this uh, kid went to trial. And unfortunately, he was found guilty. Okay. Now, all they had was two kids. They had two little kids. And obviously, something happened to these poor little kids. I mean, it was terrible. But, uh, I, you know, the kids just... One of the kids wound up recanting this story. So we really only had to deal with another child. Uh, the testimony of another child. And that was really all the evidence they had. The child telling the parents... And then the parents going forward. And what's scary is obviously, you know, the kid had the wrong individual because this poor kid was was abused. And it's, it's got awful. But he had the wrong person. Uh, these kids all uh, stayed in a daycare. Uh, this lady ran a daycare out of her house. And this individual, Greg Kelly, the football player, was staying there because it was close to where he played football. 
his home was further away, so we were staying there so he could do his practices, his two-a-days. So he winds up getting accused of this. And the way it's starting to play out is really scary. It all goes back to, you know, when they have a target or when they have somebody that they believe is guilty, they will never say they're wrong. You know, the prosecutor, the state, they'll never say they're wrong. Law enforcement, they'll never say they're wrong. They're wrong. And you see him what's, what's going on and how this is playing out. He goes to trial. Unfortunately, he winds up losing trial. They deliberate. You know, and the, one of the jurors is actually on the show, and the jury was saying, the juror was saying how they were first split 6-6, six, six, not guilty and guilty. And then they came in and told them, all right, we're going to get you, you know, a uh, change of clothes because you guys aren't going home until you come in with a, with a unanimous verdict. Long story short, what do they do? They all wind up coming back guilty. Now they put this kid away. Now in Texas, which I'm not familiar with the way it was explained, the jury also comes up with the sentencing. So this kid was facing 25 years minimum to life maximum. So after he, after he was found guilty now, he was in the back, uh, the next day he came out. Uh, three minutes before he went in front of the judge, the attorney came into the room and told him the judge was willing to give him 25 years, not risk having the jury give him life. Now, he was already found guilty, so the judge was willing to give him 25 years if uh, he signed, you know, a, pretty much a plea deal, agreeing to it, like a deal. And in the deal, you have to waive away your right to an appeal. So the kid asked his family, he's like, I don't want to make any decisions anymore. What do you want to do? So the family just, you know, looked at it, which I understand. He was already found guilty. They wanted him to at least get out. They were like, you'll get out when you're 44. So now he signed, the, he signed it, and he wound up getting 25 years but he waived his right to an appeal. So it's getting very interesting. Now, what piqued my interest was this person who had nothing to do with anybody. His name was Jake Bryden. He gets involved. This guy is just a, a construction worker, from what I know. He owns a construction company. And it's fascinating because this guy was just so turned off. He knew this kid was innocent. I mean, you could watch it, and you would just know that this kid would not do something like this. And he wound up getting involved. You know, he uh, he seems to be a huge advocate, and uh, I think he had a huge part in uh, what wound up happening. What wound up happening, thankfully, was this individual um, wound up, the judge wound up reversing the conviction. Yes, so the judge wound up, you know, reversing the conviction. This was years later. I believe the kid spent uh, six years in jail five years in jail, something like that. And obviously, you know, it ruined that portion of his life. I mean, he lost he lost out on going to college. He lost out on so many things. He was labeled a pedophile, which is the worst you could be labeled. And, you know, he was actually offered two deals. First, they offered him 10 years of probation, no jail time, but he'd have to register as a sex offender. He wouldn't take it. Then they offered him five years probation, same thing, had to register as a lifelong sex offender. He wouldn't take it. He said, I'm not going to take a plea for something this heinous that I didn't do. And then, you know, this poor kid winds up uh, locking into the 25 years where he waives his appeal right. So I'm very curious to see how that all played out because he wound up getting uh, set free in 2017. And that was actually the Texas Court of Appeals overturned his conviction. So I'm curious to see how that's all going to play out. And I believe he spent actually a little more than three years behind bars. But either way, again, there's nothing worse to be convicted of. There's nothing worse to be accused of if you're innocent. And it really showed, you know, when you're hearing some of these snippets, you hear how the prosecution, they're just so animate. You know, at the beginning when this was all taking place, how we have the right guy, this is the right individual, 100%. You know, they never take a step back, and it's it's scary how some of these prosecutors, they don't want to go by the facts. They just want to go by what initially comes in, and that's it. It's gospel. Nothing will deter them from that. And, it, you know, I just don't understand it. If you're supposed to be in the business of finding out, especially in this, wouldn't you want to find out the real person, uh, the, the real individual? who was guilty of such a heinous act, low-life degenerate act, wouldn't you want to find the real person 
and not jam up somebody who had nothing to do with it, a completely innocent individual. And then I was reading, they wound up reopening the case in uh, 2017 because they wound up finding out, of course, it was somebody else. Um, it was the guy, I believe it was, it, he was a friend of this Craig Kelly. And this individual, uh, he talked about it when he was away. He got picked up for something else and he was in jail. And apparently he was talking about it in jail. It was uh, drug charges. And apparently he, he mentioned something about it. He confessed to the crime while he was in jail, uh, supposedly. But then they went and they searched this guy's house and they found all kinds of child porn on his computer and all kinds of degenerate low-life stuff. So it was, you know, this was like the individual that unfortunately abused this poor, this poor child. And yet he got away during this time and this kid, Craig Kelly, was the one suffering in the meantime and now he's out and this kid's gonna have to rebuild his life I believe he's like 24 now and he's gotta rebuild his life now after getting hit with something so horrible you know and the more you dive in and you start hearing about all these different things and all these people who are innocent and put away it just gets worse and worse on the same <clears throat> on the same show they talked about a guy named uh, Michael Morton and again the the overzealous prosecution they had a bandana and they wouldn't this guy was accused of murdering his wife and they had a bandana and they refused to test the bandana for DNA it's it's incredible they just refused to test it you know they put together a case this guy was found guilty they didn't test the bandana for DNA he wound up doing 25 years till they reversed his conviction because the DNA on the bandana wound up proving in him innocent and implicating another man. So imagine that. This guy, from he went away in 1986, and he did 25 years in jail for the murder of his wife, which he didn't, he didn't do, all because they wouldn't test a bandana for DNA. I mean, what would be the reason behind that? You know, I'm sure they made up all kinds of reasons. I'm just, you know, I'm just... Uh, summarizing here but that was the bottom line they didn't test it they had it they could have tested it they could have figured out right away if this guy was the was the killer or not <clears throat> now i'm sure they made up all kinds of nonsense rash reasonings of why they didn't want to want to test it but, but if it goes back to like i was saying if you're truly after the truth why wouldn't you want to test something like that if you have some kind of concrete evidence wouldn't you want to exhaust all efforts to make sure you have the right individual that you send in the right person to jail and and you know the more you you start surrounding yourself with these different cases and you start diving into them and you start really opening up each level of the justice system and you start reading about people who were affected and who were convicted you know wrongfully facebook is really uh, another good source for getting inside stories I'm not a big social media guy I, I only use it for uh, for business I use it actually I use it a lot for um, groups to learn about topics uh, as I mentioned earlier I'm into dogs and there's a lot of good dog books we can learn about uh, different types of breeds and it's great for that I, I don't really use it socially but for those kinds of things there's a lot of groups for the wrongfully convicted people who did time and are now out and it's just endless, endless cases. And it's a broken system is the bottom line. And you see these things play out. And when you look at it all from the outside looking in, and you start to see how it's all pieces of a puzzle. When you talk about the Wikipedia that I spoke about and how that plays a little factor and how that plays a factor, it influences people. It influences jurors. It puts out a false narrative. Then you get the headlines before a case or while a case is going on. You get the media involved. You get people painting uh, defendants guilty before they're even charged, before they're even arraigned. All these things, it's like one big machine. You know, and that machine pumps all these different things out from every different angle. And then you wonder, well, how could the jury find people guilty? Well, that's how. You know, it goes back to what I was saying about being a free thinker. You know, when... You have to learn to disregard that stuff. When you're on a jury panel, you have to try to be fair. You have to try to not fall for all these tactics. And as we know, all the people who were wrongfully convicted, they fell for it. They didn't see through it. 
either because they didn't want to or they didn't have the intelligence to see through it or they were lazy. I don't know the reasonings, but I don't excuse it. You're a juror. You have a responsibility. You're not excused. If you get it wrong, you should have got it right. You should have took the time to get it right. I don't care if you got to stay in that room overnight. I don't care if it's hard. I don't care if you're arguing. I don't care if you're the only one out of 12 jurors and it's 11 to 1 against you, but you know somebody's innocent. Don't break. Don't just give in to go home. You, you hold somebody's life in your hands. That's a very, very important responsibility. You don't really get much more important than that. And to take it so lightly is a problem. And so many got it wrong. When you look at all of the innocent people who are behind bars, where now, thankfully for DNA, they're coming out, you know, or now on appeal, things that were done wrong, everything starts to surface. You think of all the times these jurors got it wrong. There's a problem not only with the justice system, there's a problem with the jury process. These jurors are just not educated in the sense that they don't know what their responsibilities are because they're not following it. They don't understand what reasonable doubt is. They don't understand that you're not supposed to convict somebody because you may think they're guilty of, of doing a crime but not the crime they're being charged with. You know, they just, they're not functioning as the way they were intended to function when the Constitution was put together. They're just not doing the job. They're not following the guidelines. And that's a problem. There has to be a way of making sure they, they do. And I'm hoping by at least enlightening prospective jurors and having people see the damage that could be done and making them understand what, what their responsibility is. Maybe that could change a little bit of a tide. You know, maybe one or two of the listeners will become a juror and something will click and they'll remember something and they won't just follow what's being played out and they'll look deep into it. And as I always harp on, if somebody's guilty, they're guilty. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you can't force a conviction. If you don't have the evidence, the evidence is not there. If you see the government is creating evidence, forcing evidence, forcing a narrative, that means they don't have a case. If they have to work that hard to try to confuse the jury by, by using all these terms and using all these uh, what-ifs to try to have juries speculate of somebody's guilt, th they're not guilty. If somebody's guilty, it's there. The evidence is there and the, the evidence will lead you there. But to, like we talk about in the past, to bring an informant after informant who's lying, who never met somebody, and want a jury to render a decision of guilty, and then they do that, that just tells me, you know, none of these jurors have the education, have the intelligence, or have the backbone to stand up for what's right. And they don't understand what their job is. They don't understand what their role is. And, you know, out of all this craziness going on, a lot of it, you know, I, I don't agree with, but the theme I do agree with is there's a problem with the system. There's a lot of corruption, and there's a lot of things being done wrong. And those type of people are the ones who should not be involved, should not be involved in law enforcement, should not be involved in the legal system. Anyone who's corrupt, anybody who's not there to do their job, and anybody who's not going to go by the law, they shouldn't be involved. That's really what this whole this whole thing should be about. It should just be about getting rid of the bad and keeping the good. Those who are doing their job, it is what it is. They're doing their job. That's all you want, a fair trial. You want things to go fairly. You want to have your day in court and be judged by a jury of your peers. Not We don't want all these things to be so hypothetical, you know, and not a reality. And unfortunately, it looks great on paper. It sounds great. When you work, walk into the courtroom, you see all these quotes and all these sayings of how justice will prevail and how lady justice is blind. And it's just not a reality. It's just not. It's a false s sense of security that we try to give ourselves to believe that's how the system works. So when someone is tried and found guilty, they're guilty. That's it. No mistakes were made. And that's all it is. It's, it's not real. That's not really how things play out. And until you, you start understanding that, nothing's going to change. People have to start acknowledging that there's a problem, 
and we as the people are part of the problem because when we have the opportunity to rectify things and to sit on a jury and to make sure the individual in front of us, the defendant, gets a fair trial, and if we don't do that, we're part of the problem. We're adding to the system. And none of that's going to change until mindset changes and until the right people are in the right positions of power. You know, you want fair judges, you want a fair prosecuting team, you want fair law enforcement. That's the only way this thing works. Now, can it get there? Yeah, eventually it could get there. It's not going to be perfect, but it could be a lot better than it is now. Because I see it on all ends now. It's just, it's, it's, not, it's not working. Too many innocent people are being found guilty. Too many agendas are being served. Too many people are being selected as targets. And then by all means necessary, whether they're guilty or not, they're going to have to go through the system simply because they were put up on a board one day and the powers to be, to be decided, let's get this guy or this girl. That's really all it boils down to. Then they build their case around that. And that's a big problem. No, that's it for tonight. Uh, again, watch that show. It's um, called Outcry. It's on Showtime. It's really interesting. Uh, also, we're eight away from 5,000 subscribers. Honestly, I didn't think I'd get to 5,000 subscribers. I'm, I'm surprised and humbled and, and excited about that because at least people are listening. People are liking what I'm doing. And I got a few ideas for the show. I'm actually going to be doing a, an interview soon with uh, some repeat guests um, that I had on pr previous, uh, some forensic experts. They're going to be on. And I'm working on a few other things where I'm trying to bring some uh, individuals on that I believe. I, try to, I want to bring people on that not only the listeners will find interesting, but I can learn from. And uh, I think that will make a good topic of discussion. So... Uh, that's it. Have a good night. Talk to you next time.